Hello and welcome to the True Crime and Research Podcast. I'm your host, Ayelis. Today we're continuing our series, Shit Out of Luck, the eventual capture of the Moors murderers. The middle of the 20th century ushered in the swinging 60s in England. It was a decade of unprecedented freedom for teenagers, but for some children in the northwestern city of Manchester, the 1960s were nothing short of a nightmare. Dances and even grandmothers' houses, children were taken and their short lives swiftly ended by a young couple forever known as the Moore's murderers. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were the pair responsible for some of England's most notorious murders. The two met while working at a chemical company in Manchester when Myra was just 17. Brady, who was four years older and born in Scotland, was notably intelligent. In his teen years, he began his criminal career breaking into homes and burglarizing them. These acts would land him in a youth detention center as well as prison. There, the Marquis de Sade and Hitler would become keen interest in the young man. Henley's childhood was marked by poverty and domestic violence, sometimes facing physical abuse herself. When she met Brady, she quickly became infatuated. Though early on, she could did describe him as a crude, uncouth pig in her diary. He went on to become her Glaswegian lover. Some believe that Henley developed folie de ix, if I can say that right, a condition in which delusional beliefs are passed from a primary person to another within a close relationship. If Brady's morbid interest and disposition would soon transfer onto her, the two would eventually move in together into Henley's grandmother's house in the town of Hattersley, outside of Manchester, where they would commit some of the crimes that would earn them the title of British Society's Benchmark for Evil, as dubbed by the BBC. On November 23, 1963, Brady and Henley found their first target, 12-year-old John Kilbride. John worked for Pocket Money at Market in Ashton, Underline. When he was hanging out with some friends there when Henley approached them. She asked the boy for help, for help in locating her missing glove on Saddleworth Moor outside of Manchester. John agreed, and they headed to the moor. There, Brady sexually assaulted the young boy before using a string to strangle him. They buried his body in a shallow grave, but not before Brady snapped a picture of Henley standing over it holding her dog. A year after John was married, the, the vile couple preyed on the, their youngest victim. 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey. The little girl was spending the day after Christmas at a fairground when the couple lured her away. Leslie Ann's death has become especially well known as the details are particularly gruesome. The horrifying final minutes of the girl's lives were documented both in photographs and in an audio recording, which had later been found in two suitcases left at Manchester Central train station by the evil couple. Photos reveal that Leslie Ann had been taken to their house, where she was bound and gagged with a scarf. Brady took pornographic photos of her and sexually assaulted her. The heinous audio recording lasted an excruciating 16 minutes. On it, Leslie Ann can be heard begging for her life, crying for her mother, and asking God for help. Also heard on the recording are the voices of a man and woman, which police believe belonged to Brady and Henley. Chillingly, it's reported that Little Drummer Boy can be heard playing in the background. After the youngest victim came their oldest victim. Edward Evans was a 17-year-old apprentice engineer. Brady went out on the night of October 6, 1965 with the object of committing a hate crime against a gay man. According to testimony, the idea was to rob the man in order to pay off some debts. That night, the couple didn't act alone. With them was him brother-in-law, David Smith, who was also just 17 at the time. Some sources report that Brady found Edward in one of Manchester's earliest gay bars, while others report he found him at the Manchester Central train station. Edward was lured back to their house, where Brady tied, tried to rob him. However, Edward was presumably bigger and stronger than their previous, previous victims, and he fought back. What happened next is disputed by both Brady and Smith. According to Brady, Smith started striking Edward, 
However, Smith stated that he was in the kitchen when he heard a very loud scream coming from the living room. There he saw Edward lying halfway off the couch with Brady and Henley in the room. He tried to quiet the boy, but when he didn't stop, he struck him around his head and shoulders with a hatchet. Brady didn't stop hitting the boy until he was quiet. At this point, Smith said that Brady took a cushion cover and wrapped it around Edward's head. He then grabbed a cord, which he wrapped around his neck and strangled him. According to Smith, Brady looked up at Henley, who was watching all this, and stated, That's it. It's the messiest yet. Smith then helped him clean up because he was scared stiff. After the room was clean, the trio had tea before Smith ran home. He and Henley's little sister, Maureen, left their apartment to find a phone to call the police. Brady and Henley were soon arrested. The police found Edward's body in the couple's home. It's reported that his preteen neighbor led police to the moor as she had been taken there several times by the pair. The bodies of Leslie Ann Downey and John Kilbride were then found. The photo Brady took of Henley over John's grave would be used to locate his remains. Leslie Ann's body had been found not far from it. She was still naked, save for her socks and shoes. The suitcases, which contained the horrifying evidence of her capture and murder, along with books on torture, were also discovered at the train station. After the claim ticket had been found in the spine of a prayer book in Henley's possession, the couple faced seven charges in total. Each was charged for the murders of Leslie Ann Downey, John Kilbride, and Edward Evans. Henley was also charged as an accessory to John's murder for harboring Brady after the killing. The two would plead innocent at the trial, which began on April 19, 1966, and lasted 14 days. Psychologists stated that the pair showed no signs of being capable of having empathy. During Smith's testimony, he stated that prior to Edward's death, Brady told him that he'd already killed three or four others. The New York Times reported that Henley stared at Smith, unfortunately, as he gave his testimony. A horrific 16-minute audio recording of Leslie Ann before her death was played in court. Brady was found guilty on all murder counts, while Henley was acquitted in the case of John Kilbride. But she was found guilty of being an accessory to John's murder, as well as guilty for the murders of Leslie Ann and Edward. On May 6, 1966, Brady and Myra were sentenced for the crimes they committed, both receiving life sentences for Downey and Evans, Brady received an additional life sentence for Kilbride, and Henley received a seven-year concurrent sentence for her involvement. Judge Fenton Atkinson placed more blame on Brady for the murders, making an interesting statement regarding Henley. Though I believe that Brady is wicked beyond belief, without hope of redemption, I cannot feel the same as necessarily true of Henley once she is removed from his influence. In the 1980s, news broke that Brady and Henley were not responsible for the death of three children, but rather five. After they revealed two more victims, the two additional children had been missing since the mid-60s. Police immediately began searching the moor for the bodies, even taking Brady and Henley out of prison to assist in the search. One of the victims was actually their first, predating John's death. Their kill happened on the evening of July 12, 1963. 16-year-old Pauline Reed was making her way to a dance when she ran into Henley. She asked the teenage girl for help in finding the glove she had lost in the mall. The same ploy she would use four months later on John. As Henley was actually an acquaintance of Pauline, the trusting girl obliged. She was taken to the mall, struck over the head, and slashed in the throat t- twice. While Ian Brady and Myra Henley may be dead and gone, the horror of their 28-month killing spree has haunted England for years. And that's uh, all we have for today's episode of Shit Out of Luck. Let us know your thoughts about these people in the comment section below. Give us a thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed. And then check out the videos up here. 